Source Friday. This is a Twitch stream that I do every Friday on, on GitHub's Twitch um, and, and now expanding to other platforms. But basically, we talk to open source maintainers or core contributors about their projects um, and we figure out how can we get involved or we get to the chance to learn more about open source. Um, before I introduce our our guest, I do want to like point out just people saying hello. Uh, feel free to like say where you're calling in from. Someone said greetings from India. So hello everyone, I'm super excited. I think I recognize this person's name from Resilient Coders, which is a coding bootcamp I graduated from. So hi everyone, I'm super glad that you're tuning in. Um, but without further ado, I did wanna give Simon um, a chance to introduce himself. I've heard a lot about him, seen a lot about him online. So I'm really excited to like get a chance to talk with him one-on-one. -on -one. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Really great to be here. So yeah, my name's Simon Willison. Um, I'm an open source developer, a full-time open source developer at the moment, um, which is exciting. Um, um, and I've been working in open source for, honestly, around about 20 years now. Um, I was um, one of the co-creators of the Django Web Framework back in 2003, 2004, which has since grown to, to, to be pretty, pretty, pretty big, and a lot of people are, uh, are using that today. Um, but more recently, I've spent the last five years working on an open source project called Dataset, which I'm going to show some examples of today, um, which is along the theme of data journalism. In my career, I've, spent a, I've had a few cases where I've been able to work directly at newspapers or in news organizations, and I feel like Data journalism, the act of like using programming skills to help tell stories is one of the most exciting things a, a software engineer can do. Um, I've also, I've, I've, I've ran a startup for a few years, which I sold to Eventbrite and moved out to California. I'm from England originally. Um, and so I've, I've done sort of like architectural work on uh, uh, helping build, helping scale Eventbrite and things like that too. So I have a lot of different interests. Um, the last year I've got very heavily into AI and language models and all of that kind of stuff as well. So there's all sorts of stuff that I'd love to talk about today. Um, but yeah, um, it's great to great great to be here. Awesome! You had such a rich career. Like I didn't know that you you worked at Eventbrite and um, did stuff with like data journalism or like worked at news companies. Like that's really cool. Um, but I didn't know. I knew you were the Django co-creator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so that was a great introduction. Um, I'm curious. What is what is data set? If you can give us like a, a brief synopsis on, on that. Sure. So the idea with data set, data set, I call it an open source multi-tool for exploring and publishing data. Basically, the idea is you've got some data. So you've got like a CSV file or a bunch of JSON or, or something. What do you do next? Like, what's the next step to do something with that data? And I started this, originally it was inspired by work I was doing at newspapers. So I worked for the Guardian newspaper in London and we collected so much data about the world because anytime you see an infographic in the newspaper, you see a map or a chart, somebody had to go and get the numbers. And those numbers were reported, right? A reporter contacted a government agency, got the numbers, double checked them. Like there's a lot of work that goes into that raw, that raw information. And um, I met the journalist at The Guardian who was the sort of lead on, on doing this work, a chap called Simon Rogers. 
And he had hundreds of spreadsheets on his computer, just hundreds of meticulous spreadsheets telling about the world. And they lived under his desk on like a big desktop computer. And um, we got thinking, we were saying, okay, well, is there any reason not to publish this data? Like, could we start publishing the data behind the stories? And so we launched this thing called the Guardian Data Block, where the idea was anytime we put a story out that's backed by data, we also publish the data. So you can go to the data blog and get the spreadsheet of numbers that we use to report a story on the economy or demographics or whatever it is. And at the time, the tool we used for publishing the data was Google Sheets because it works, it's free, everyone knows how to use it. We didn't have to actually buy a product for it. And that worked out okay, but I always felt frustrated by its limitations. You know, it's, it's great for medium-sized amounts of data. You wouldn't want to put a million rows of data in a Google Sheet. It doesn't have great API, so you know, if you want people to be able to automatically extract things and explore it, it's, it's kind of limiting. And then five years ago, I literally was having a shower when I had an idea. It was an idea that came to me in a shower. I was thinking, hang on a second, maybe that problem we had at The Guardian can be solved better with the, with the tools that we have now. And the, the tool that I was particularly interested in was Vercel, the hosting provider, which back then was called Zite Now, because um, what Vercel lets you do is they let you host a web application online essentially for free, provided it doesn't have a database. Like they let you do stateless applications which is great, but if you need a database, which has to have backups and all sorts of complexity like that, they kind of leave you on your own. You have to go and spend money somewhere. And I realized that if you're publishing data, you don't actually need a full database. You need just a read-only database. And SQLite, um, the, um, the embedded database that's been around actually for 20 years as well, just gives you that. So the idea I came up with is, okay, what happens if we take a bunch of data, stick it in a SQLite database file, which is just a file on disk, um, and then we package that with an application and we ship it to Vercel or Google Cloud Run or Heroku or one of these very inexpensive hosting providers. And the, the data itself just becomes another asset. It's like a big CSS file or something that's bundled into your application. And you include a web app that lets people interact with that database. So that was the initial idea for dataset. It was what happens if I build a simple Python web application that sits on top of a read-only database and lets you poke at it and lets you search it and run SQL queries against it and browse it and all of that kind of stuff and host it for literally cents per month. Like the cost of hosting just a small, like a, a, a 50 megabyte file on one of these hosting providers is almost nothing. So if you're a news organization where you might put out three or four stories a month with data, the last thing you want to do is spend $10 a month on each of those because after 10 years, your, your entire organization's budget will be hosting fees. Um, so I think we should probably jump into a demo so I can show you what this thing looks like. Um, I think I've got screen sharing set up. Yeah. Um, so this is the website for dataset, dataset.io. This is actually dataset itself. This is the software with some custom templates, but um, that's kind of misleading. I'll show you what it, uh, an example of what it looks like. So. Here is a database that I created of the training data behind stable diffusion, the image generation. Oh, really? Because it was one of the things that's so interesting about these models is how are they trained? Like, how do these things work? And um, it turns out stable diffusion is trained on like a few billion images, but there are 12 million of them that are flagged as, as having the best aesthetics and have the highest influence on stable diffusion. And so I got a hold of a database of these 12 million images and I stuck it in dataset. And now we can search. We can say things like Wait, Obama can I, can and I see all you? of your yeah, yep. One person just asked, can you zoom in a little bit on the screen? Because they're Absolutely really Absolutely yeah. good call. Yeah, here you. we go. <laughs> this is dataset. It's, it's a table, but you can also do things like run searches. So here I've searched for Barack Obama. I've searched for Obama. There are 9,000 images that went into this training set of Obama. And you can see that they're not all Obama, right? Like that's not Barack Obama. Um, that one is, that one, he stood there. It's kind that's of fascinating weird. how, because it's just going on the captions for these images. Oh, okay. So it's kind of a miracle that these things are so good at, at rendering Obama when the training data is very untidy. Yeah. Um, one of the features of dataset that I, I'm really, um, I, I use a lot is the ability to facet by things. So here we can see, so we've got 9,000 results with Obama. 
If I say facet by domain ID, I can see that 419 of them came from the Daily Mail, 242 from Fine Art America, 233 from Pinterest. So you start getting a really good sort of idea of the shape of this data just by running a search and then doing a few um, and then clicking around in it a little bit. Um, I have lots and lots of other demos. Um, I'll show you this one because it's kind of fun. This is a demo I built of this um, data set of parks in California. And this is demonstrating geospatial data. So one of the things you can do here, um, data set has a concept of plugins, which can add extra features. And I built a plugin that lets you draw a shape on a map, and it will then run a query for just things within that shape on the map. So now I can see that within that shape of the Bay Area, we've got 2,600 parks. Wow. I'm going to search for mini and see how many of those are mini parks. Here we go. This is every mini park in that shape that I've drawn. And really, this is a demonstration to show that you can, that when you've got some this to add plugins, you can do all sorts of weird and wonderful extra features on top of this. Um, another thing you can do with data set, which I hinted at earlier, you can use custom templates to turn a data set instance into a full website. So here what I've done is I've taken the archives of the San Francisco Microscopical Society, which is a 150-year-old society of microscope enthusiasts based in San Francisco, and I OCR, they, they scanned all of their journal entries going back 150 years. Wow. I ran those through OCR, and now I've got this data set instance which can actually run searches. So if I search for, say, Isaac Newton, it will show me, oh. That's crazy. That, that's it. Here we go. It'll show me pages in their archives that, are, that, that, that mention Isaac Newton. And this is actually just my data set software running, um, but with a, oh, I'm trying to remember. I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to remember where the database for this is. Um, maybe it's slash data. Let's try this. Oops. Okay, it's called SFMS. And so if I go here, this is just data set again. It's a SQLite database with a wow. bunch of documents. Each document, document has a bunch of pages. And then the rest of the site is custom templates built on top of this that give you this interface for searching through journal entries about microscopes. So yeah, it's, um, I'm interested in a lot of things. And one of the reasons I'm so excited about Dataset as a project is it lets me, anything that I'm interested in, there's an excuse for me to try and build a database of it and use Dataset to interact with, with that data. You know, I'll show you one more example because I'm really proud of this. Um, no, this is amazing. Keep going. <laughs> one of my hobbies is I love exploring tiny museums. So whenever I go to a new city, I look on Google Maps for museums and I scroll past all the big ones and I try and find the little ones because the little ones are always more fun because it doesn't matter what they're about. If they're small enough, the person who runs the museum is probably there. So then you get to go and have a conversation with somebody about their little tiny museum. And so this website right here is, um, how many is it? It's 111 little museums that I've been to. And for each of them, I've got like photographs and notes about what I saw there. Like here's the Golden State Model Railroad Museum, which has photos of the railway and all of that sort of stuff. Super, super rewarding hobby. But again, this website is data set. Um, if I go to, oops, if I go to slash browse, here we go. We can see that there's a database table called museums and it's got all of those museums in. This is a plugin I wrote, which um, kicks in if it finds a latitude and longitude column and draws them all on a map. So now I can zoom in and see, oh, here are the, like, wow, there's 27 that I've visited in the Bay Area. I mean, I live here, so that's not a huge surprise. Um, but then it also lets you build features like, um, I've got a use my location button, which runs a SQL query using my latitude and longitude and shows what? me the closest museums to me. So I'm near, this one's shut down actually, which is a real shame. So oh, if you love Pez Dispenser. Yeah. yeah, that was a great one. There's an aviation museum nearby, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and all of this is completely open. Everything I've shown you today is open source. If you go to Simon W slash museums, um, this is the GitHub repository that shows that, that has all of the source code for my museums and all of the data and all of that kind of thing. But yeah, so it's, um, there were a lot of moving parts to this. Oh, I've got actually one more relevant demo. Um, so Dataset yes. is a Python web application, which means that in order to use it, you have to be able to install Python and use Python to install Dataset and run terminal commands on your computer. And it's, 
If you're a Python developer, it's completely fine. If you're not, the barrier to entry is quite substantial in getting this thing running, which I find really frustrating because I want people to be able to use my software. Yeah. So last year, I started getting interested in WebAssembly and being able to like run things, run more things in the browser. And I realized that um, with WebAssembly, you can actually run Python applications entirely in the browser as well which is kind of an amazing trick. So I built this thing called Dataset Lite. And actually, um, for this demo, I'm going to open up the DevTools so you can see what it's doing. Let's do the Network tab. So when I hit this page, this is installing this thing called Pyodide, which is actually a full copy of Python compiled to WebAssembly. Oh. So this is the Python, inter Python, um, the Python interpreter is now running in my browser. And then it runs pip install, and it installs dataset itself and all of its dependencies, and then it launches at the browser. So this right here is my Python web application, except if you look at the URLs, it's at slash, at like hash slash fixtures. This is dataset running entirely in the browser, which is honestly, it kind of amazes me that this is even possible. It's got yes. almost all of the features, it does faceting and so forth. But the really fun thing is that you can give it the URL to a CSV file, say on GitHub. Let's do, um, what's a good CSV file on GitHub, I wonder? Um, you can actually put these in gists as well. So if I look at, oh, there was one called train.json. So here we go. Here's some, here's some more training data from a, um, from a large language model. This is from the star code model. So I can copy and paste the URL from that gist, and I can click load JSON, paste that in. It will now reload that application. But one of the things it will do is it will hit, it should be in there. Maybe I've got a search on somewhere. Oh, it, but there we go. It's, it's, hit, it's hit the GitHub API, and it's pulled back that data from that gist and loaded it into a SQLite database. Just wow. in my now I can see, in this case, it's this is um, this is code from GitHub that was used to train the star code language model, which can then write code and things. And um, you can also, because everything's in a read-only database, you can run your own SQL queries. So in this case, I can say, you know what, I just want the SHA and the language, and let's do the content from this table here and hit run SQL, and it'll give me back just that. And then I can bookmark it and send that link to other people. And that link will then um, open up that data for them as well. That's a really important feature of data set. Everything is bookmarkable because the whole point is to, is to explore and share data with other people. This is awesome. <laughs> you know what, I'll throw in one last demo. Um, Do it. Because I was so keen on solving the installation problem I built, I ended up building an Electron application. So this right here is an app called Data. Oh, it's a desktop app? Too? Yes. Wow. And this is actually just, it's it's the web application. I think if you go to data slash desktop, maybe. Here we go. It's a Mac application. You can install it. When you install it, you're actually installing a full Python environment and Electron and Chrome and all sorts of stuff. So it's quite big. But once you've done that, you can use that to start exploring SQLite databases on your local computer. And um, this is one, uh, somebody shared a, uh, CSV file the other day on Hacker News of 15 million straight LinkedIn net listings. Um, so I loaded that to the data set. Now I can do a search for GitHub and find the 26 companies from there that, that mention GitHub in their descriptions and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so this is, so I'm basically on a constant quest to make this easier to run because I want journalists to use this and journalists aren't necessarily Python programmers. So right now I've got um, dataset itself, you can install dataset desktop, the, this web app, this um, desktop application, dataset Lite, which you can use in a web browser. And I've been working on dataset cloud, which is a paid hosted SaaS version of dataset what? cloud. Okay. So yeah, lots of projects, all sorts of projects. <laughs> it's uh, keeping on top of it all is, is, is a bit of an asset. I loved it. Wait, um, quick, quick thing. Um, before we went live, I didn't hear like a. There's like a popping sound in your mic. Maybe it's close to you. Not sure. Uh -huh. um, but it's like I don't know. I will tweak the gain and see if that helps. Let's let's hope this is a little bit better. Let's see. I think I think it stopped making the noise. Cool. Okay. Great. That's good. Oh. Actually, it's still there, but that's okay. Anyways, um, the there's a couple like takeaways I had, and then there's also questions from people in the chat and comments as well. One, um, 
just learning about how journalists like use data and then um I didn't I, I love that you had this shower thought of like how to solve these problems I feel like a lot of my my best thoughts come from showering and even someone in the comments named Echo Yin said great ideas are almost <laughs> coming from people showering I could I could stop sharing so you can switch um, but then also um I loved all the different projects you use, like the stable diffusion, um, the the like using it for for like maps and stuff like that, and and um all of those old letters. I thought like a lot of it was cool. It was a lot of information, but I'm like geeking out about all of it. I'll highlight some comments of people also geeking out about it, and then I'll highlight some questions that they had. So okay. someone said, "This is so interesting. This is amazing. Oh my gosh, this is fa fascinating." Someone said, you're a more experienced person, it seems. I don't know if you missed it, but he did say he has 20 years of open source experience and he like created Django. Um, but then in terms of questions, um, I actually had a similar question to this person. They said, in terms of making data set more accessible, what are your thoughts on Pyodide versus dev containers and code spaces? I just happened to find Simon's dev container.json while working on a SQL at DC today. I actually was wondering that too. I was like, what about are, are code spaces enabled? Yes. Okay. Code spaces, so I have a tutorial on the data set website, um, dataset.io slash tutorials, which talks about using it with code spaces. Because code spaces is just perfect for this kind of thing. Um, my favorite thing about code spaces is I like running tutorials and workshops. And the worst thing about a workshop is the first half hour when everyone in the room has to get a Python development environment working. And it's a nightmare. It's an absolute, because somebody, it'll, there are so many ways it can break. And so I've switched all of my workshops in the past year over to using code spaces because firstly, everyone in the room is on the equal playing field. They click a link and they get an environment. And then the best part is if they break their environment, they can get a new one. So you, you can't break it, which I, that, that to me is the, that, that's the, perf the perfect thing about that thing for development environments is it's just completely removing that, that um, ability to break things. The one catch with code spaces is that you can run data set in it and it works for you, but you can't share that with other people. Code spaces only allows you with like logged in with your GitHub account to, to, to view that application. So honestly, that's the only limitation. So it's great for personal usage and for learning how to use it and things like that. The one thing it doesn't solve is, is publishing to other people. Um, and there are lots of ways to publish. Um, Dataset has a built-in command on the command line version where you can say, dataset publish the cell name of SQLite database dot db and you hit enter and it will package it up and it will publish it to the cell or to cloud run or to Heroku or to fly and that's a, a plugin thing as well so you can build plugins for extra publishing platforms and that was the one of the original ideas was okay what if you could have an application that can deploy itself that can that knows how to package itself up and, and put it online so people don't have to learn how to deploy to Vercel and Cloud Run and Heroku. And that's a, a really important feature. You can do that from code spaces. So I've, I've tinkered around the code spaces, got myself to a point where it works, and then I've published to Vercel from code spaces. That's kind of cool. You know, that, 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 that totally works. Um, but yeah, yeah so um, dev containers, I've not got my head around yet. I've been trying to understand. I, as far as I can tell, it's, it's another, it's, it's built on top of WebAssembly. So it's, it's a much more sort of rich WebAssembly based environment. I want to learn more about those and figure out if they can work. Pyodide is extraordinary. Like Dataset Lite took me a weekend to build. And that's because Pyodide just solves all of these problems for you. It's an astonishingly um, well-engineered piece of software. Um, and I, I love that. And um, I, I also love that it's, it's another version of a sort of safe environment. You know, if you install software on your computer, you might break your computer. If it's running in Pyodide in a web browser, the worst that can happen is that your browser tab crashes. So it takes away all of the sort of fear and concern about running weird code that other people have written. Um, and yeah, so I love this. I feel like it has never been easier to run code than it is today. And it's yes. still way too hard. Yeah. It's yeah. not easy enough yet. But yeah. if you've got a web browser, you can run code in WebAssembly. Hosting, there are so many inexpensive hosting providers now. Vercel do have a fantastic developer experience. Code Spaces is a miracle. It yeah. really is. Um, and I think that's really exciting. I think the thing that angers me most about being an, a software developer is how hard this stuff is. Like yeah. the number of people who we, like the learning curve on just getting started with Python or JavaScript is 
so steep. And the number of people who don't make it up that three months of misery and hence never become programmers. And if we managed to get them past that three months, they'd be doing amazing things right now. Yeah. So, that, so anything we can do to, to reduce that friction, I think, is super valuable. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Oh, I'm also echoing a little bit. But I completely agree with you on everything you said. From um, you, when, you, when you brought up the code spaces and like, teaching workshops, that made me really excited. Because when GitHub first started talking about code spaces, and they were like, oh, it's like good for like if you, you want to reduce your onboarding time or whatever. Um, but the main thing I saw was I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to make teaching workshops easier for me. Because like I, I, I run a, um, or I helped to run a coding boot camp for women who were learning to code. And like I relate with you, especially in a remote like setting, it was really hard to be like, make sure you're on this repo, make sure you're doing this. So like just having them open it up all in one is great. Um, I don't know much about Pyodide or WebAssembly, but it sounds amazing. And I agree with you on wrapping your head around um, the dev container stuff. Like I am, I am now like diving in to like start, I've been building out dev containers just to teach myself about like, what are the idiosyncrasies? What are the like limitations and all that? We have another question around Pyodide that I don't fully understand, but they said, yay, Pyodide, are you doing everything in the web worker? Yes, I am. Um, I wrote this up. If you, I think data set light, there's a link to the GitHub repository, which links to some blog entries where I write about how all of it works. But yeah, it's, it's done in a web worker. It's a few hundred lines of JavaScript, the whole thing. Like it's astonishingly lightweight in terms of the, the code that's used to get this working. Like it really surprised me how, how easy that was. I've switched to a different microphone, by the way. So let me yeah. know. If you want to no, it changed. It got so much better. <laughs> I, I, I have this fancy thing and I just ditched it for my MacBook Pro and now the audio is good. So okay. there we go. <laughs> sometimes I have, a, I have a Blue Yeti too. Sometimes, I don't know if now, but it gives me problems too. Like sometimes it's a little echoey. Um, another question uh i didn't fully read it yet hey scott i think they mean simon hey simon what have you done what you've done here is super cool and your dedication is great to see i was just wondering as someone that's used shiny r a couple of times for similar web apps to share with specific people what would the advantages of switching over to data set be i have to admit i have not played with shiny r nearly enough to, to have a great answer to that um so i mean Datasets' big focus is it's for rate it's relational data. Like if you've got anything up to sort of a gigabyte of data, dataset is a really good fit. Fit it can go up to sort of two gigabytes. Once you get past that, it you need a pretty expensive like server to to to, to serve something up that, that's larger than two gigabytes. Um, so my my sort of rule of thumb is if it's too big for um, if it's not like if it's more than a few th uh, more than a few hundred rows, it can be good. Dataset light is free because it's running on GitHub pages, actually. So um, if you just want to share data up to sort of 10,000 rows, you can stick a CSV file in a gist, and you can use Dataset Lite, and there's no installation, and it won't cost you anything. So I feel like that's sort of almost a no-brainer for a whole bunch of data sharing things. But yeah, I can't really talk to differences between Dataset and Shiny R, unfortunately. Well, that, that makes complete sense to me. Um, we had another, we have a lot. People are loving this. <laughs> Uh, oh, actually, just wanted to highlight this because I that was in my mind too, but it slipped my mind. But yes, I you could. Know that. Yes, you could do that. You can set your your port to visibility to public in code spaces, or you could even do private, but just to your organization. So, okay. like, yeah, yeah. If you go into that, like the terminal where the port section is. Oh, that's brilliant. I mean, so presumably that only works while you're actively working on the project. Yeah, that's, that's right. Because in a workshop, that means that I can say, oh, yeah, share your data set with other people in the workshop. And so that's fine. No, that's that's great. I'll look into that. Cool. Yeah, I have a blog post on it, so I can I can, I awesome. can share that with you. Um, someone asked, is it possible to, oh, that's not maybe necessarily related. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think they, they also had asked earlier, which is why I highlighted them. They wanted to know, like, um, when you were showing those pictures of Obama and stable diffusion pictures, can someone like add original photos to the database? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. In my case, um, so that demo there, that's the, the fixed set of training data that was used for stable diffusion. So this is an interesting thing with data set generally is originally it was all about read-only data. So you can publish data, but if you want people to modify that data, you should use a different tool. That's changed over the past few years. I've started adding plugins that can let people 
upload um, upload additional CSV data or edit or run like SQL queries that update things and so forth. So over time, data sets are becoming more of an interactive um, uh, uh, application, but that the hosting becomes more expensive then because all of these cheap hosting providers, the one thing they don't give you is a disk drive that you can write to. You know, Heroku and Vercel and CloudRun are all read-only. Fly.io does give you disk disk volumes, and so I've um, that's sort of my 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 hosting choice right now for data instances. They're going to write to a database is Fly, but you also still have to think about backups and all of that. So it's it's you can absolutely do it, but it's um, it's more work that way. That makes sense. Thank you so much. And yeah, I just wanted to highlight their questions because they were asking a couple of questions. But just to let you know, well, I don't think we know anything about Unity games here, or, or at least it's not really. It's all, I'm afraid, no. <laughs> um, okay, so another question. Someone said, uh, Simon, data set is incredible. What motivates you? This is great because that's like one of my questions anyways. What motivates you and what advice would you give to listeners on why they would contribute to open source projects? Okay, so my number one motivation is completely selfish, right? In that I never want to have to same, save, solve the same problem twice. Like in the years before open source, I would find myself, I'd build like a little like um, article editing interface for a company and then I'd go and work for someone else and I'd build the same blasted thing again and again and again. And all over the world, everyone else was doing the, solving the same problems. It was a massive waste of human capital. And I feel like the... Single best thing about open source is if I can write some code and release it under a, uh, a an, open, an open source license, I will never have to write that code ever again for the rest of my career. Like no matter where I'm working in the future, I can always go back and say, well, 15 years ago, I solved this stupid problem and I'm just going to reuse that. And so as a result, in working on open source myself, it's basically a way of guaranteeing that I won't have to duplicate my own effort, which is, I think, a perfectly, it's, it's a, purely selfish way of looking at it, but it totally works for me. And then when everyone else joins in as well, the 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 prop we like I feel like open source has won, and it really has won, you know, because we really we don't have to constantly reinvent the wheel all the time. There was a time like 15 years ago, com a lot of companies were res resisted open source. There were so many companies who would say, no, we do not do that there. You're not allowed to use open source software within the bounds of this. About 10 years ago, I feel like that kind of, kind of died off because of NPM and JavaScript. Like if you want to build a web page, you can't do it with a no open source policy. It just doesn't work anymore. But it took a long time to get there. You know, Microsoft themselves used to be used to like be anti open source. That's completely changed. Like Microsoft now one of the greatest companies on earth for, for open source contributions. Um, but yeah, and I, so I feel like that for me is the, the sort of key to open source is don't make us don't make us duplicate work. Like let us all constantly be building on top of each other's work. Um, and then in terms of my own sort of personal motivations, I just love working on. So data set, as I said earlier, it's the perfect project for me because I have very wide ranging interests, and every single interest I have in the world can be boiled down to: Can you build a database of that? Like, and can you can you do something with the data? So having a sort of core project in the middle that's that's data oriented is really useful. The other thing I sort of touched on this earlier, Dataset has this concept of plugins. So you can install plugins that add new features, and those plugins I've written about a hundred of them, and I think there's 120 total now. So the people in the community have been writing them as well. The thing I love about those is I can have a stupid idea for a feature. And I can build it with no risk to the project itself. Like I can play with, with things that I think are, are dumb. And because I do them as plugins, there's no harm caused. Like I don't end up having to having code in dataset core, which relates to some stupid feature that was just an experiment for a weekend. But as a result, as I get more interested in things like large, large language models for AI or um, geospatial things with maps and so on, I can use plugins to play with those. So I'm sort of building out dataset itself but in this kind of isolated way where if something's a waste of time or if it, if it, if it ends up being a bad idea, it doesn't matter to me. So that, that's been really useful for me as well. I, I love that perspective. Um, I know Pamela also commented plus one, that's why I can't stand writing cool source software. I want myself and others to be able to use any code I've written. I love the, I love the software engineering industry for that. The fact that we want to share things and, and help others to grow and, Instead of, like you said, repeating ourselves over and over again, we have one solution that we all use. I was 
I, I didn't really realize that was the reason that we that people started embracing open source more was because of like NPM and stuff like that. But I think that's because I, I huh? feel like that yeah. broke the dam. Like all of those last remaining companies who were like no open source here. I yeah. kind of feel like it just became untenable. Like yeah. try building a modern web application without using like open source JavaScript. I, yeah. It's almost impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And um, Pamela asked, but I think you did mention this on how do you monetize data set? I know right now you're in GitHub Accelerator and then you yeah. talked about the fact that you're creating a SaaS like Yes, um, that's the, the, the ambition is I want to boost, bootstrap the paid version of data sets. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, I feel like of all of the open source business models, that's the one that's that's been proven the most. You know, WordPress did it with um, WordPress.com. GitLab have done it. So many of these different companies have, have demonstrated that you can do it. You can have an open source project and then people pay you to host it for them because you're better at hosting than anyone else. So that's my that's my my short to medium term goal is to get that live and, and use that and and um and use that. But I've also I've done GitHub sponsorships and uh, bits and pieces of consulting and things. But yeah, the, the big plan is the is the SaaS play. Exciting <laughs> for, for when that comes out. Okay. I actually wanted to pivot like you told me that you wanted to talk about blogging a bit. And I'm actually excited to talk about that because I blog I try to blog every week. The only times I really fall off is if I um I'm at a conference or something. So I'd love to learn about like the role blogging has had in your in your career and all that. <laughs> cool. So I started a blog at simonwillison.net. Um, it's called Simon Willison's Weblog. It's got a nice original name. Um, I started it in 2000 and, oh my goodness, 2002, I think. Was it 2002? Yeah. So it's 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 coming up on its 21st birthday. It's nearly old enough to drink in, this, in the United States. Um, and back then, like 2002, there weren't that many of us blogging about, like blogging was pretty new as a thing. And blogging about web development, just writing about web development and technology stuff, there were probably only a few hundred of us doing it, which was kind of cool because you got to know everyone else. You know, you, you, you ended up building this network of, of just other bloggers because this was before Twitter. This was before Facebook. The, 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 the social network was that you'd blog and you'd link to each other's blogs. And we all had RSS feeds and RSS readers and that kind of thing. And um, it has had a, I mean, I feel like the best time to start blogging was 21 years ago. The second best time to start blogging is right now today because blogging still works. In fact, um, there was a period, so back like 20 years ago, one of the things about blogging was if you blogged, you would be on the top of, of the Google search results for anything that you wrote about because Google rewarded websites that updated frequently and that other people linked to. And that's what blogs were. And that, that faded off over time. So come sort of 2010, 2011, just blogging about something wouldn't put you on the front page of Google anymore. I have a hunch that that's quietly flipped back again. I feel like so many people switched to posting on Facebook and in private groups and stuff that actually, if you blog like it's 2003, your stuff is actually going to start ranking again. So you can, so that SEO, the sort of SEO juice is back for blogs, as far as I can tell. But then the most important thing about blogging is, um, I feel like if you want, if, if, you're, if, if you have any interest in it at all, if you run a blog where you post two or three times a year, and you keep that going for two or three years, you'll have six or eight posts, and that right there will have give you an enormous advantage in things like um, the, the jobs market. Because anytime you apply for a job, the people, the, the, the hiring manager, they're going to Google you. They're going to just, they're, they're, they'll chop um, and they'll see, see, see if there's anything out there. And if I've got, and I've, I've hired a lot of people. And if I'm looking at 10 candidates and one of them has a blog with a post from two years ago about how they figured out how to install Postgres and nothing else, that still jumps them up in my head because they've proven to me that they can write, that they know what Postgres is, that they can, you know, there's a whole bunch of that sort of initial candidate analysis where you're like, does this person, like, have they got a clue about how to do certain things? And if they've got an article that they've written, that's it. That's enough. I feel like um, it's the same thing with um, having a GitHub, uh, like having public GitHub repositories. You don't need many. If you've got like, one project that you did that you put on GitHub and in the readme, you put screenshots because the code's probably not going to work. No one's going to read the code. But if you've got screenshots of what it did, then that hiring manager, they're going to bounce around. They'll find that. They'll skim through your readme and they'll be like, OK, well, I don't have to ask FizzBuzz. This person knows how to write code that works.
those kinds of things. So yeah, so I feel like there's a level of blogging which is very much just write a few things and put them out there and you can pretty much forget about it. And that will still give you that little corner of the internet that's yours and, and, and a good impression. And then mm. what I've been doing over the past few years, I, I got into the habit of writing week notes where once every two weeks, because weekly was slightly too much, I just write a blog entry about what I've been working on. And originally that was to try and keep myself accountable on my open source projects. But also it just turns into, it's what, like, like Duolingo, it's a streak. Like now I, I'm like, well, I've got to do my week notes because I've done them for two years. I don't want to, to you know, lose the streak of doing those. Um, but yeah, um, and then if you are interested in blogging, the two tips I have for things to write about. Um, firstly, my favorite form of blog is what I call TIL, Today I Learned. Because one of the problems with blogging is there's that you feel this pressure to write something new, right? Like, why, what's the point of writing something if it's not a new piece of information for the world? Which is a trap, because if you think that, you're never going to write anything. You'll end up with hundreds of draft posts that you never published. What you want, what I do instead, I actually have a separate blog for this, my til.simonwillison.net blog, is anytime I learn a new thing, I jot down a few notes, like a few paragraphs uh, or a few sentences, and I publish a, a thing about what I just learned. And this can be stuff like, I learned how to do a for loop in Bash. And the fact that everyone else knows how to do a for loop in Bash doesn't matter because the expectation of TIL is, well, I just learned this thing, right? I've got, I think, 400 posts on there now of all sorts of little bits and pieces. And I don't care if you know it already, but if you don't know it, it's useful for you. If you stumble in off a Google search, maybe it'll answer your question. And it's really, it takes me, each of these posts takes me 10 or 15 minutes to write. So it's a very low sort of input, low, low, low effort way of publishing. So that's the, the one the one format I love is TILs. The other format that I think everyone should embrace is anytime you, you finish a project, you should write about the project. Because like write about the things that you've made. And this is a I've actually set myself a rule now that the cost of doing a project is I have to write about it. Because I do lots, I keep on getting distracted and I do lots of little things. And I've said to myself, okay, if I'm going to spend like half a day building or a day or two days building something, the cost is I have to then write about it and put a screenshot of what I built. And this is a massive engine for content growth. But also, I feel like if you don't do that, you are basically throwing away 90% of the value that you created, right? If you spent time building something and you learned something, you, you made something, you should put a screenshot, you should at least give, give yourself a chance of communicating what you built. And then in five years time, when somebody's talking about something, you say, oh yeah, I built that five years ago, here's a link. And so you end up referring back to your archives a whole bunch of times. Um, so yeah, that's um, some my advice for writing. Okay, I've got one last piece of writing advice. The trick to blogging is you have to publish it while you're still actively unhappy with what you've written. Because um, if you... If you hold out until it's perfect, you will never publish. You will end up with this folder of drafts that you've never done. So I, I almost take pride in hitting publish on things where I'm like, it's not good enough yet. It's not. It doesn't capture everything I wanted to say. I, I'll, I'm, you know, it's. I, I, I'm not happy. I'm going to publish it anyway. And then what I'll do is I'll put it out there, and then an hour later I'll reread it and I'll fix a few typos. And I'll, you know, you can you can make changes to stuff once you put it live. But that has been absolutely crucial for increasing my publishing rate. Just, just accepting that if you wait until it's perfect, you'll never publish. And that doesn't, like, if you're working on a corporate blog where you've got, you get somebody to, if, if you've got the benefit of an editor, fantastic. You know, you've got somebody who can make that judgment call on, red, on when it's ready. But if it's just you, you don't have that editor, I think you should act to try and publish stuff that you're not happy with yet, because the alternative is that you don't write anything at all. I love this advice. First off, I'm going to just re-highlight some links to people um, just for them to check it out. So your Today I Learned um, blog is til.simonwillison.net. Mm -hmm. um, also, your, your regular blog is simonwillison.net. And then also for people that want to check out dataset, it's github.com slash simonw slash dataset. I love everything you said about um, blogging. And I, I agree with you. I think like like you said, like people get a little bit nervous to actually post a blog because they're like, oh, it needs to be brand new. Or I, I know like, you know, software engineering, it kind of has this, um, 
I don't, I don't know what it is, but I, I like this, like, oh, it has to be like, I've created this new thing that no one's ever thought of, like that vibe. <laughs> yeah, so it could, it could be discouraging, at least for me, I, um, I had always been a blogger, but not like a tech blogger, because right. I was really scared of like, putting that stuff out there. But once I started working at GitHub, it would, I realized how helpful it was for me to be able to blog, because one, I expressed my thoughts like way better in writing. So then people were like, oh, okay, like you said, like, this is how Br Rizal's brain is actually working. When I talk, it, I, I am like more stumbly, less eloquent, right. like my thoughts are all over the place. So getting your thoughts all out on one place is good one for employers and other people to be able to network in and connect with you. And then like you said, um, for for hiring as well for people to be like oh this person actually does understand what they're doing they understand the process they understand the little challenges and roadblocks like I, I i completely agree with you on everything you said um a couple of people said i love that your your blog still has rss <laughs> someone said my first post on current blogger on my current blog from 2007 wow <laughs> um Actually, there's one more thing I'll say about writing. Yeah. I feel like if you want to be a senior software engineer or a staff engineer or whatever, writing is one of the core skills. You know, clear communication is what separate, what is, is really what distinguishes senior engineers from, from, from less senior engineers. And blogging is such a great way of, of developing those writing skills. I've actually, um, when I work for companies, one of the first things I do is I start up a little internal blog um, using whatever I can find, like Confluence has a blogging thing that you can turn on that kind of stuff because then you can do the same thing but for internal bits and pieces today i learned how to set up a development environment or my team just launched this project here's a screenshot that kind of stuff which is it's weird like very few people do this and it massively increases your influence within the organization you know if if there's, if, 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 if your team's projects get screenshots and a few paragraphs explaining what you built and crediting the people who worked on it and so forth, that's a great way of elevating your, your team's work and, and, and sort of helping, helping people understand what you've been doing. And it's a great way of practicing your writing skills and stuff as well. Yeah, and it, it serves as documentation. Too many times I join a job and people just have things in their head and I'm like, how do you do this? <laughs> it's, also, it's the best kind of documentation because if it's in a blog, nobody expects you to maintain it. Like if I read a blog entry from two years ago telling me how to install Postgres and it doesn't work today, I'm not like, wow, that that was misleading. I'm like, oh yeah, sure, it's two years ago. Whereas the moment stuff's in the official documentation, you're, you're making a commitment to keep that up to date in the future. And so, yes, yeah, so I'm a huge fan of, I call it temporal documentation, like documentation which captures a moment in time and was accurate for then, but doesn't come with that promise that you'll, you'll keep it maintained forevermore. Yes, love that. Um, some people said, I not, I love the acknowledgement about blogging and passion about sharing your projects, uh, regardless of the outcome. And someone was like, so even if you don't like your work, you still publish it. I yes. actually, I relate with you because, okay, so GitHub has their official blog, but then we also have a, a dev.2 blog. And I have a tendency to just, like, I don't even ask my team to review it because it's not... It's not like our official blog. It's just the blog that we use. So I'll just like post whatever random like technical thoughts I found. And sometimes people will DM me and be like, Rizal, there's a typo. Like yesterday, someone on um, Mastodon was like, you spelled update content command wrong. And I went back and edited it. So, like it's no big deal. <laughs> and usually if um, GitHub really loves that blog post, they're like, hey, put this on the GitHub blog, but we're going to refine it for you so it can be right. Corporate yeah, I mean, um, the key thing I think is, and this is true of all creative pursuits, nobody else knows how good the thing you wanted to build was. Yeah. Like, you've got this idea of this blog entry that will be completely amazing and explain this concept that people have never seen before. And then you type it up and you're like, eh, it's kind of, it doesn't fit that dream I had in my head. But you publish it and nobody who reads it will have the slightest idea that it's lacking. You know, they're comparing it to not publishing anything at all. So, you know, it's, um, it's not like there's, when I'm reading other people's blogs, sometimes I'll skim it and I'll be like, oh, this isn't useful to me. And I will close that tab and I will not think anything worse of the person who wrote that. You know, it's just like, oh, okay, this wasn't the thing I needed to read right now. But yeah, I think that, and it's psychologically, it's so important because it's so easy not to publish. Like it's it's so easy to, to think, you know what? It's not quite there yet. I'm, and I've got a folder with a hundred drafts in myself. You know, I, I've not managed to overcome that yet. But yeah, the... um. That's the key. I think it's knowing that nobody else can see the perfection that was in your head. 
Love that. Someone said, thanks for providing inspiration to create a blog. So yes. <laughs> oh, that would be so cool. Um, I, I know I had more questions, but I, I'm kind of liking interacting with the, the comments if you don't mind. Someone said, um, do you have any, well, I mean, I guess you gave some, but do you have any tips for overcoming that initial fear of perfection for posting your first blog or Today I Learned? So this is why I love Today I Learned, because honestly, the thing is, it's like, like the, 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 the best kind of TIL is one where you try, you search for something and you couldn't find the answer straight away. And then you spent like half an hour poking around and figured out how to do that thing because you know that that's new and that, that information, nobody has posted the thing that you were trying to search for. So you, that, that you found a little hole in the internet. You found a tiny little gap. That's it. That, 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 that to me is the sign that it's, it's, worth, it's worth publishing something. Something I think, so because I've got like 20 years of experience, um, I very deliberately like to write TILs about basic things because I think it's really important to sort of show that you can be doing this stuff for 20 years and it's still worth celebrating when you figure out how to write a for loop in Bash or these, these little things like that. Um, but yeah, so I'd say that's the main thing is, is if you search for it and couldn't find the answer and then figure out the answer yourself, that right there is valuable content that's worth writing up. Like that, that that's going to, it's going to fill that hole. Awesome. And someone said, it's been great learning from your experience for the past three years or so. So I guess they've been reading up on your, your, your I, work. <laughs> I learn in public. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm very keen on learning in public and building in public. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I'm on uh, Mastodon and Twitter and uh, i played around a bit with blue sky and so forth but also mainly it's mainly I, I i blog these days i'm blogging something most days and some yeah. of those are just little link blogs you know it's a link and a, and a, and a description and then once or twice a week i'll put up a, a full a full sort of post um i've also i've got a, i've got a substack newsletter now which is Ooh. exactly the content of my blog just copied and pasted into the newsletter but it's kind of fun because substack don't have an api but they do accept pasted content. So I've built a very elaborate system for based, it uses data set and observable notebooks and things to generate my newsletter. And then I can click copy and click paste and send it. So oh. it's like, yeah. um, if, if we've got time, I could, I could do a quick demo of how that works because it's kind of fun. Yeah, show us. All right, let's do this. Um, okay, yeah. Um, so. Uh, can, can, am I screen sharing? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so this is my blog. Um, this is actually a Django application um, running on Heroku using Postgres. Um, and it's got a bunch of content on it. This is my newsletter. And if we click through to the latest newsletter entry, you'll see that it's got my latest blog entry and then seven links and three quotations. Those are things that come in from that sidebar on the right. So as I scroll down here, there's my blog entry, and then link colon this, quote colon, the quote from somebody, all of that kind of stuff. But the way this actually works is that I have a copy of my blog running in dataset. So if you go to dataset.simonwillison.net, um, I'm going to load up one more thing here as well. Um, here we go. This is my Django database turned into SQLite and backed up and, and up here which means I can do things like run SQL queries. So here's a complex SQL query that joins together my block, my bookmarks and my entries and my quotations, and it puts them all in a big list here. So like I did a, a bookmark, a bookmark, an entry, a quotation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I've got this thing. This is an observable notebook. And what this does is it composes that giant SQL query here, and then it runs that SQL query against dataset by using the dataset JSON API. So a neat thing about dataset is everything that you can see in the interface, you can get back out as JSON as well, including like you can pass it a full SQL query and get back. So it's like a, an API for running read-only SQL queries. So it pulls that content back and then I muck around with it a little bit and then I generate HTML and render that on the page. So this right here is the HTML for my newsletter generated by that SQL query. And then I've got a big button at the top that says copy rich text newsletter to clipboard. So I click that. Oh, um, there we go. And then if I go to Substack and do uh, new post and hit paste, that's my newsletter. That's the whole thing. And Substack even handles pasting in of images and stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> and then all I have to do is add the title and add the subtitle and click send. And that's it. So, yeah. So, um, 
it's kind of fun this because it's a really fun example of a whole bunch of moving parts, right? I've got GitHub action, I've got the Django app for the blog. I've yeah. got GitHub actions that download that Postgres database, convert it to SQLite, and then post and then um, deploy that with data set here. I've got data set itself running that SQL query. I've got the observable notebook. I've got all of these bits and pieces, and it works, you know? It's, um, and then if you want to see more about how that works, um, if you search for observable on my blog and sort by date, I think um, I've got automating my week notes and new, uh, semi automating a Substack newsletter with an observable notebook. So this is a, a write up of the thing that I just showed you. Um, that's so cool. But yeah, so that's really fun. And that's, um, that's kind of the mentality I have to software engineering around this stuff is it's all about. It's kind of the Unix philosophy, right? It's little tools that do one thing, and then you pipe them all together, except that you don't have to use Unix pipes anymore. You can now use JSON API calls and JavaScript running in observable notebooks. And I love that the final step of this thing here is copy and paste. I think there's something almost a bit subversive about saying, well, you haven't got an API, but I can paste stuff into you, so I'm going to use copy and paste as my API there. Yeah, you're giving me so many ideas, because I kind of... Um... Well, sorry. Uh, I kind of like stopped maintaining my newsletter because I couldn't think of new things to write, but I didn't even think of using my blog. And then you have such a streamlined way. <laughs> no one has complained. Like nobody <laughs> has said, oh, your newsletter is a waste of time. I already read your blog. If, if, they just, if, if, somebody does, if somebody cares, they'll just stop subscribing to the newsletter. And mm -hmm. so instead I've got like uh, 1,300 subscribers now, I think, who just basically it's people who don't use RSS readers can use the newsletter instead. But yeah, I, I, I've, I've found that. I, I think that that pattern of automating newsletters through copy and paste is something that more people should do. I love it. Um, we only have a few minutes left, but this comment made me remember that you also wanted to talk about like AI and LLMs. Very quickly. <laughs> they said they consider you the authoritative source on LLMs happening now. <laughs> I blog about it. I, this is another one of those things about blogging. So I started blogging about AI in September last year, really, when Stable Diffusion came out. I put up a blog entry where I said that um, Stable Diffusion is a really big deal because it was the first time one of these modern AI models was something you could run on your own computer, which I found really exciting. Um, and then I've been writing about, and then ChatGPT happened. And you know, ChatGPT is not even six months old yet. It came out November the 30th. Wow. <laughs> Everyone's it, using it though. Even right, right. Technical Everything technology. has changed because of yeah. this. And so I started blogging about AI related stuff. And it turns out that, um, you know, if you start blogging about things, people start reaching out to you. So I get invited to dinner at weird mansions full of AI researchers in Silicon Valley and stuff, which is super fun, you know, and very odd. Like That's it's cool. Very odd. <laughs> well, it's just because I blog, right? I write about mm -hmm. AI. People who are doing work in AI read that. I get invited to things. You know, it's, it's a great example of how much influence you can have just through writing about stuff. Like, I'm not an AI researcher. I mean, I, I publish the experiments that I'm doing with things, but basically I, I've kind of found myself in the situation being a bit of an AI pundit. You know, I put out, put, put out I, I, I try and keep people up to date with it. The challenge with AI is that you've got two, you've got two ends of the spectrum, right? There's the hype, which is deafening. And then there's the AI doom and gloom, which is, there's a lot to be worried about, you know? like. Um, most almost everything people say is a problem about AI is true. Like all yeah. of the stuff about um, the the training data is stuff that people didn't get permission for. It does threaten all sorts of like jobs and things. There are all sorts of negative sides to it. And I've been trying to find a point in the middle where on the one hand, the criticisms are real and we need to understand them. But on the other hand, the stuff that this can do is so interesting to me. All of these things in my career, which have been really hard now, a solvable that's fascinating so i'm trying to sort of find that midpoint between the crazy hype and the, and the doomerism and figure out okay there are bad bits there are good bits what's the stuff that we can build now i love that and i agree there are a lot of there's the people that are like 10 things you didn't know you could do with ai and it's like okay <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i do i do think the ethics around it it's it's so it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> I've never in my career encountered a field where the ethics are so non-obvious. Yeah. Like there, are, there, 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 there are no easy answers to any of this stuff, which is, yeah. is I feel like 
honestly, if you have a degree in philosophy and linguistics and so forth, you're in a bit better position to work mm -hmm. about reason in the space than those of us who have just done computer science. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I would love to hear philosophers' perspectives on this. Okay, yeah. so we're at the 59 mark. I'm going to ask the, the wrap-up questions. And instead of asking you what's a dream open source project that you would like to create one day, because you told me that, that it was this one. I'm doing it, yeah. <laughs> Somebody asked, what did you learn today? So I'm going to ask that um, after, after the other one. So my first one is, what is the first programming language that you ever learned? Um, it was basic on the Commodore 64. Okay. Um, which was, and Dataset itself is named after the Commodore 64. The disk oh. drive for the Commodore 64, no, the cassette drive was called the Dataset. Oh. And so that's where the name came from. That's so full circle. I love that. Okay. Um, you, we talked about this, but you can expand on it. I asked the question of if money was an issue, how would you ideally spend your time job-wise or not job-wise? I mean, this is, so I sold a startup a few years ago. So I have, I'm currently self-funded with a runway that is not unlimited. At some point in my life, I need to start earning money again, which is one of the reasons that I, well, actually with Dataset, I want to earn it, I want it to have enough revenue to hire other people to work on it with me. So it's not just about covering my own expenses. I want to like grow a team around it. Um, but yeah, so basically it's, it's, it's this, like um, the, 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 this is, the set of problems that I find most interesting in the world. I love data journalism. I love the idea of helping journalists tell stories with data. And so building open source software that targets that is kind of my dream project. Love it. Um, and then um, someone asked, oh, I didn't finish writing it on here, but someone said, what did you learn today? That was their question. I think in, in, in reference to the TILs or today I learned. <laughs> Well, I can't tell you what I learned today because I got up to do this. <laughs> I, learned, I should have got up. I should have got up earlier. Um, but yesterday, I learned a whole bunch of stuff, and I'm actually going to write a TIL about this. I learned about null using null byte delimiters in command line tools, so that you can have one tool output like three chunks of text with a null byte delimiter between them, which you can then run three have three other commands that run against those. Really obscure. Took a lot of fiddling. I was learning how to use hex dump and, um, oh. and Python to output slash zeros and all of this stuff. But it was useful. And I'm going to write that out. That was, um, I posted a blog entry last, yesterday about some new tools I've been building for command line language model use. So you can like mm -hmm. curl the New York Times, pipe it through a thing that strips HTML tags, pipe that through a language model and tell it to summarize it. It gives you a summary of the front page of the New York Times. And so part of that, I was messing around with the limiters and things. So yeah, I will have a TIL posted later today with that thing that I learned. Looking forward to it. Okay, last two questions. How do you pronounce the word GIF? Do you say GIF or GIF? I do say GIF, and I know the person who created it says GIF, but I think <laughs> they're wrong. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> okay. The very last question is, what's your favorite Beyonce song, if any? <laughs> you know what? I fall into that trap of all of the music I like is what was at university 20 years ago. So now I haven't got one. And I, I feel bad about that. I need to, I live in America now. I need to fix that. That's okay. I know, I mean, I'm not even old, but like I hear like the songs my younger sisters listen to. I'm like, that's not music. So I get it. <laughs> that's definitely music. It's just that I haven't, I need to pay more attention to the, I need, need to absorb it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, this was really, really exciting. I thank you so much for like your time and your knowledge sharing, like even today, but then overall with your blog post and, and all of the open source projects you've been putting out. I also thank the the um audience because they were really like engaged and had a lot of great yeah, we got some great questions. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, it was better than the ones I wrote. I was like, I'm ditching them for, for the, the questions in the comments. Um, but we've reached time, y'all. So oh actually, do you have any last things you wanted to highlight? I, I'll highlight again your your uh, repository for data set, your blogs that's as perfect. well. Yep. But, okay, that's it? Okay, cool. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, and stop by next Friday for the next Open Source Friday. Bye. Cool. Thanks.